one. Where do we uh, draw the line? What, what is the beginning of the modern? Is modern simply having technology, gadgetry, industrial revolution? Is it the enlightenment? Is it the episteme? What is it really? Um, and Halak, I think, you know, he has a more narrow definition of what modernity is than some other thinkers who try to even expand it back to the, the Renaissance even, or just after the Renaissance. So Halak is talking about modernity as basically the point at which um, the state became sovereign. Right. Yes. Okay, so, uh, whereas, and someone's like, and, and we do this all the time, even again, talking about anachronisms, when we talk about um, uh, the Muslim state of Medina, right? Halak would probably uh, bristle at that. He'd have, he'd have a heart attack if you said that to him. Yeah. Yes, he would. He would. He'd he'd fail you if you were a student of his and you said that and you quoted that in an essay. Yes. You'd fail in his class. Yes. You'd get a big red line. Yes, exactly. You would. You would. He, he. His point is that the state is something entirely different. It's. Yes. It's a technology of governance that has that is completely unprecedented in its reach and its ability to shape the interiority of subjects. Whereas uh, before there was always something external to governance to hold it to some type of accountability, even if there were uh, individual situations where maybe there was a despot or a tyrant who, who su superseded those bounds. But yes. at least even, even the, the, mm. the king that claimed to be a god, um, he had to adhere to what people's expectations were for what a god should be. And he risked um, losing legitimacy if he violated any of those sorts of expectations. The king, you know, before constitutionalism, there was still a sense of common law. Or there was a sense of, of proprietariness or justness that had to, to be adhered to. Um, that was above himself. Yeah. He couldn't, he didn't have absolute sovereignty in the sense that he yeah. couldn't do ex just exactly whatever he wanted to without any justification. He had to justify himself yes. according to some regime of sensibility or some regime of, 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 of ethics. Whereas what happens with the modern state is that uh, the modern state has freed itself from needing to legitimize itself to basically anything. It doesn't admit that, right? If we look at the, dem the democratic state, we have all this pageantry about elections and things like that, social compact theory and this kind of uh, collective delusion that um, w we uh, accept the governing structures just by going to the polls every four years, right? Uh, which is kind of a fantastic notion. But uh, in reality, in reality, uh, mm -hmm. the state is completely sovereign absolutely sovereign in, a, in an unprecedented way it has there's, the, there's, there's a fantastic quote here i actually have it on my iphone because I, i'm yeah. so impressed but by halak I'll, if, I may, if i may just read it it's about the secularism but also to do with uh the state he says uh i forget which book this is from i think it might be from the impossible state let us remember what secularism is writes professor halak secularism is not just segregating religious life into the private sphere it is rather the determination of the state of what religion is and is not, where and how it can be exercised. In terms of political theology, I mean, political theology, that's a subject in itself, secularism is the murder of God by the state. Yeah, that is so, that is that sentence itself is so cool. In terms of political theology, secularism is the murder of God by the state. The state can delimit, limit, exclude, or curtail any religious practice, thinking here of France, for example, and thus has the power to determine the quality and quantity of the religious sphere as it sees fit. <laughs> I mean, that's absolutely that's a great prose, but also yeah, it really gets to the heart of the matter in terms of this idea of political theology is something I'd love to see more re revived, not just not just theology, which I'm very interested in, or just politics, but political theology, because the West has a very uh, profound political theology, or they might not put it in those terms, uh, in, in its secular view, uh, where, where secularism is the murder of God by the state. The state is the new God, particularly in places like France, where the ultimate authority, the sovereignty now belongs to the state in a very absolute way. And lo and behold, if any Muslim possibly says Allah Akbar, God is greater than, which is just the, the basic belief that God is sovereign. And, and that is um, political suicide in France. You, it, it's actually a blasphemy against the secular God to actually say God is greater than that. Um, anyway. Yes, no, France is actually a very useful example for uh, showing the type of secularism kind of taken to its, its, its final form or maybe its logical conclusion because, you know, there's a lot less, uh, the, the mask has been ripped off, so yes. to say, 
you know, all the, the pretense of toleration and the pretense of, uh, you know, rational discourse is completely gone. I mean, they, they simply uh, are viciously kind of attacking and policing the interiority of people. And that's the kind of point of that Halak has, right? Because it's not simply how you conduct yourself in public. It's how do you feel interior, you know, to yourself? Are you, is your allegiance to the state? Yes. Or is your allegiance to Allah or yes. Islam? And if, and we're going to find out yes. if your allegiance is really to yes. Islam or to Allah, maybe it's the hijab, maybe it's Allahu Akbar, maybe you're, you want to yes. homeschool, maybe you have a beard, whatever, whatever that external signs are, what yes. we're really concerned is, is your interiority. That's totalitarian in a way that no pre-modern governance structure could imagine. And certainly um, no Islamic governance. If you look at the, the great Islamic, uh, the Ottoman empires and so on, people were allowed to believe and have their own communities. They weren't required by the state to believe anything. Um, you know, on the contrary, Christians were allowed to uh, drink wine and, and eat pork and have Christian beliefs. And so in an Islamic framework under Islamic governance. And uh, it was, but the, in a sense, the, the Islamic experience historically, politically, was much more pluralist and diverse in the real, in a real sense, not just in the narrow way that you mentioned earlier. The modern Western democracies are; they're much less diverse and less pluralist. And when I say this to people in the West, they just don't believe. They say, "What are you talking about? How, how can this be true?" Until you actually explain it to them how it how it's true how, how the ottoman system worked for i don't know seven eight hundred years you know or, or back to medina the, the so-called constitution of, of medina where, where um you know uh, jews and muslims and so on were e each given their their rights to practice freely their faith under the 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 the, the, the rulership if you like of the prophet muhammad upon him be peace so this is part of the dna of islam it's not some kind of modern liberal idea <laughs> very much so yeah.